The following story contains visuals that will be upsetting to sensitive viewers and it isn't suitable for children. It made headlines when disturbing footage of a series of violent assaults spread across social media. It was a shocking case of domestic abuse that sparked outrage and condemnation. We thought long and hard about broadcasting the footage, but do so believing it shows gender-based gender -based violence for what it is in our country, a full-blown crisis. Yaku Swart never thought the CCTV footage of him brutally assaulting his wife, Nicolene, would ever see the light of day. But it did. And in the voice message you've just heard, he accuses her of framing him. Since childhood, she thought he was the love of her life, but the fairy tale ended brutally. And in June, Yaku became the face of our country's gender-based violence crisis when recordings of the vicious assaults appeared on social media. These assaults took place in November 2018. Four years later, Yaku finally confessed to them, pleading guilty in court, where he was handed a suspended sentence and a 20,000 rand fine. I was very disappointed. So was she, so was everybody in court. Nicolene was supported by Afri Forum's private prosecutions unit, led by advocate Kheri Nell. Despite the outrage, Nell says the sentence isn't inappropriate. We have to put that into perspective. The sentence is based on the evidence before the court. Because the magistrate was presented with evidence, there should have been more place before the magistrate. Yaku's legal team questioned the CCTV footage's authenticity, and because the prosecutor didn't put up a fight, the magistrate never got to see it. The justice system failed Nicolene. In a country where government spends millions of rands on campaigns and box the louders against gender-based violence, you'd expect that when a perpetrator like Yaku lands up in court, he would get more than just a slap on the wrist. With South Africans expressing outrage on social media and some threatening to take the law into their own hands, Yaku went into hiding and has not been seen publicly since. Fearful that he'll take revenge, Nicolene worries about her safety and that of the couple's two boys. I was very upset why he's testifying that he's a good guy and mm. good for society and he's not. Yaku and Nicolene began dating at school. He first raised his hands to her six years into a relationship that would eventually last for 16 years. The first time was just only one hit mm -hmm. because I did something wrong and he got mad at me. Afterwards, he was sorry. Mm -hmm. A year after that, he confronted me, asked me how many intimate partners I had before. And I was honest with him mm -hmm. and he wasn't happy with my answer. Mm -hmm. And he was just going off his head, mm -hmm. punching me, hitting me. While years passed without any further incidents, Yaku's verbal abuse escalated, particularly at the Pretoria car dealership he owned and where Nicolene works. Say if I don't your plot, but I know that I'll have no spring and hug the engine bring. If you don't know, I'll have that doing. I got my engine on the way. Meskin, I got your now. I swear I got. He likes things being his way. If it's not his way. You will just snap. Were you scared? Very much so. All the time? All the time, at least the last year of my life. But Yaku was always sorry afterwards, and Nicolene always forgave him. <laughs> Nicolene describes Yaku as a likable man sociable, fun, as charming as he is manipulative. A cocktail of personality traits that made it hard for her to leave him. These behaviours aren't isolated, so in other words, it's reciprocal behaviour. Professor Corne Davis is a specialist researcher in trends and patterns of gender-based violence at the University of Johannesburg. She says women in abusive relationships often feel they are to blame for the behaviour of their partners. Typically, a, a perpetrator of violence thinks he's right. His behavior is right. So whatever action he's taking, he feels entitled to take that action and that somebody else is to blame. 
You look at uh, you know the case of Nikolin and Yaku. Yaku would perpetrate these acts and then go for long periods where he doesn't do it. How do we know, then account for that sort of behaviour? There are certain things that trigger behaviour. And because it is rooted deeply in the psychology of a perpetrator, you won't necessarily know what would be that trigger. In selfie videos he sent to Nikilin after the November assault, Yaku confesses to his anger problems. Nikolin believes Yaku's inherent anger was triggered by drug abuse that started in 2016. She used as well and says their marriage became a roller coaster of drugs, affairs, and pornography. All the while, his business faced growing debt. I can not even see if it is is or if it's a bit of a slack. I can not even see him. Edwin Stradom and Yaku were once friends. In your friendship, was he an aggressive guy to other people? Not at all. When I went out with him, yeah. not once. Edwin worked for Yaku for two years before leaving to pursue other opportunities. He returned three years later. I think he was busy was busy to fall. And the two times that I came to help him, he did not make me scared. He left me. He was slack. He came to be I think that is how he made me aggressive. He and he left me on his personal account. And it was here where the attacks were captured on CCTV. The first of the November attacks happened on the 15th. Again, Yaku apologized and Nikolin forgave him. But there was another just three days later, and this time, Edwin was first in line. Normal day by the work. We were inside this office. I came in. There was an argument, and he just started attacking me. What started this argument? There were stories about he thought me and Nicolina had an affair, but they, there was no such sprake. While this was happening, Nicolene was on the sales floor. She could hear what was going on inside and knew what was coming her way. These premises are now rented by a company with no connection to Yaku, but the infamous office windows are unchanged. You can see now the lights is on and the door is even open. You can't check in at the office, so anything can happen inside. This glass was supposed to keep Yaku's brutal deeds secret, like the beating that followed Edwin's. He came back to me, he started shouting and screaming in front of the boys, your ma is a slachte vrou en sy leen haar uit. Voor die kinders. Then he kicked me, smacked me, the boys ran away. I tried to run away, then he will come after with me and kick me again. So that day made me realise uh, he can really, he can really kill me. With the frightened children left wandering among the cars, Nicolene drove to the police station. She needed their help to fetch her boys, but was advised to open a case of assault. Like thousands of other GBV victims, it wasn't something she'd ever considered. It's estimated 70% of women in South Africa experience GBV in their lifetime, but the majority don't report it. There's no places of safety, you're going to report the case. What's going to happen? You're going to go home, back to the perpetrator who's now going to be much angrier. But Nicolene never went back to Yaku, moving to Durban with her children. Yaku, though, was relentless, stalking her and breaking protection orders numerous times. This video footage shows him driving through a gate. He demanded that she move to Cape Town with him to start a new life. I get my kinders beloven, ons gaan met die see wees, ons gaan een happy family wees. Kom nou, ek gaan geen f***ie nie, maar jy gaan wel baie f*** hee morgen, as jy nie kom. He finally gave up the fight to get her back and moved to Cape Town without his family. But the mirrored windows didn't keep his secrets forever. Deleting the damning evidence from the CCTV camera's hard drive didn't either. Nicolene got a hold of it and an expert recovered the footage. I've now looked at the video quite a few times and it's at least seven assaults, seven different assaults. We're not talking about one assault on the one day. Yaku pleaded guilty to just two counts of assault with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. The court 
never saw the footage and Nicolene never got to testify. I would have liked to have my day in court, tell my story and give my evidence because I was ready for it. Bizarrely, on the day of the trial, the state prosecutor didn't even consult with Nicolene. The collapse of the criminal justice system has reached such a stage that we have a big problem as far as preparation of witnesses are concerned, training and dealing with matters and ensuring that prosecutors have the necessary skill to do. So, was the state too rushed in chasing a sentence? I don't know that they chase statistics and you want to finalise matters, but some matters, you just have to take your time. You just have to take your time and ensure that justice is done. Now, this was one of those matters. The court accepted the defence's objection to the CCTV footage, despite the IT expert who retrieved it being ready to testify. So what Yaku did was caught on camera. This happens frequently, all the time, to thousands of women in South Africa. But it's not caught on camera and it's behind closed doors. We had an opportunity that you don't get. We had an opportunity to show the court what happens in this kind of instance and we missed that opportunity. An appeal against the sentence is unlikely to succeed. The video evidence is now part of a closed case, the conclusion of which, critics say, will hardly serve as a deterrent to the thousands of yakus still walking the streets. Thank you for watching our stories here online and please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.